We are sad because our boy is sick. Time to go on a long boat ride back to get him cured. Dad of sad. Yeah. <laughs> Dad of ill boy. <laughs> now, of course, we get the obligatory segment in all over the shoulder games where your sidekick character is unconscious and you have to walk very slowly through the game to to carry them somewhere. Name five. Huh? Name five. You can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Last of Us did it. Um, oh, well, that was one of the ones I was going to mention. Damn it. The atmosphere here is very good, though. Yeah, it is a good one. Like, I do like the, um, you know, almost middle of the night feeling thing with just like almost the very, you know, almost ash feeling atmosphere to it. Ah, uh, yeah. Really creates kind of a different feel to the places you've already been through. Yeah, uh, uh, take note, ladies and gentlemen, this is what it looks like when ash is floating through the air. Not snow, like in Silent Hill, which snows. That was snow. God damn it. <laughs> I'm still salty. Uh... Now, for some reason, I just have this weird urge to play uh, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice again. I don't know what it is. What game was that again? Uh, it was the Ninja Theory one. Um, it was one of those games where they wanted it to be AAA quality, but short so that they could sell it at a lower price point, which I thought was a good idea. Um, you play as this, uh, you, you play as this woman who's like, uh, on a, you know, kind of myth-like journey to bring back her dead lover or something. I, it's been years. I haven't played it in a while. <laughs> um, basically it's a big old, it's a big old depression game. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I could just play fucking, uh, Celeste for that. Well, I mean, this is more of a serious depression game rather than a comfort game. Like, it's a hallucinatory kind of um, dark journey sort of game. But it's also an action-adventure game. Oh, okay. I do reckon. I, I remember the sequel being announced at, like, one of the game awards. Yeah, I remember hearing about the sequel, too. Being produced for yeah. this one. It looks like it's still not out yet. No. But, like, it's 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 one of those games that's that's really well presented. But if I had to, like, level one complaint against Send You a Sacrifice is that it leans maybe a little too hard onto the depression theme. Like, it, it, like not to the point where the narrative has any problems, but more to the point where it sometimes feels a bit try-hard. Woman, do you hear me? It is urgent. I'm still a god. Go I mean, so am I, but I can't leave that behind now, can I? <laughs> I like how she's she's totally unresponsive to Kratos at first, but the moment he brings up no the fact that he business. that the kid is ill, she just jumps straight to the door. Like she has no time for Kratos's bullshit, but her priorities are absolutely in the correct direction. <laughs> it, I don't know if we learned that about her yet, but it helps that she's a mother herself. Yeah. That's why. I do like the relationship that Kratos and Freya have, the keeper that protects them. where like, and the and the thing is she's, she was you know she is all like I'm still a god go away sort of thing but like no, she totally understands where Kratos is coming from it's like don't trust gods, <laughs> yeah. Fires cannot burn there. No magic in all the nine realms can create a blaze. Luckily, I have something that's not of these realms. Will be useless. You'll need to find something else. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Then I must return home. That's where I left my life. <laughs> <laughs> would stay buried. You were before. Yeah, I like how these cutscenes are, like, very clearly not supposed to have the blades of chaos in them, so his fingers just clip straight through the chains. Yeah. This is the part of the game where you're supposed to get the 
Blades of Chaos. It's like, go home. What are you talking about? They're behind your back. No, they're not. I mean, that's what they said about Hades, and they went through in and out of there like five times. You must hurry. Through my garden, there's a path leading to my boat. Take it. Return home. Pick up your past. Do whatever you need to do. Just bring me back the bridge keeper's heart. Okay. <laughs> Sounds easy enough. So, you know, for all that the other gods are untrustworthy and fickle, at this point, spoke, even know. Kratos has to be realizing that Freya is, like, the most upfront god he's ever talked to. <laughs> Apart from the whole hiding that she is a god part. I think there was less hiding is more he didn't know and he didn't ask. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, there's no cryptic runaround with this lady. She tells him what he needs to know, and he acts on it. It's not something that has happened often between him and gods. Hellheim of all places. How will I know which one is your boat? Oh, no. It looks like a fucking homecoming for us. <laughs> the leafy boat is great. The sequences were really good, though. Yeah. It's purely for cinematic purposes, but I don't care. It's really well done. <laughs> he also... Well, I mean, you're playing this game to for the cinematic experience. Like, on, on top of the solid game. Yeah. Play. I think that's always been the case with God mm -hmm. of War. Yeah. I think what makes the new God of War work so well is that it does really... Um... It does really capitalize on the increase in cinematic standards that has happened between the last few generations in a way that the older God of War games couldn't really do. Also, it's like, I like how the moment Kratos starts to make nice with Freya, he starts seeing this. Well, as soon as we get finished with our little rotation. Yeah. It's like... the. It's like, you know, he's starting to trust Freya. You can sort of see from his behavior when he left. But the moment that happens, he starts thinking about, you know. Athena. Yeah. And how he used to trust her. But that didn't really work out <laughs> at all. Even slightly. Taking up past experiences of trusting. I, I do appreciate. Another I do God. also appreciate how, even though this is sort of a this is a soft reboot, it doesn't want you to forget. You know, the old shit happened, and how you know part of the story is how do we come to grips with what that was. But like the reason this happens now, is because, well, not only because Kratos is going back to his home to get the Blades of Chaos back, but also because his distrust of the gods is holding him back from what he definitely knows about Freya from his interactions with her. Like, he could, and on some level knows he should trust Freya, because Freya is, like, genuinely helpful. But he well, the can't. <laughs> well, the, the other aspect is, you know, by virtue of being Kratos' son, Atreus is also a god. Yeah. And Kratos' attitude is and always has been, gods are evil, you cannot trust them, they will only ever do bad things. So how, does, how do you parse that with the fact that, you know, your son is a god whether you like it or not? <laughs> yeah. Not to mention he is also a demigod himself. Yeah. Well, he doesn't think highly of himself in this game. So... Yeah. You know, he but, includes himself in that list of gods. Who, listen, he includes boy, himself on. I am no, a so shit. Yeah, he, an absolute. No, shit. He includes himself on that list of gods that are not to be trusted. The point, though, is that you know, when, when you get down to it, Kratos is Kratos knows in his head that uh, that there are things holding him back from you know doing, thinking, and feeling things that he probably should given the circumstances directly in front of his face. Good gameplay and story segregation here. I mean, the uh, 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 integration here is they throw these ice guys that your frost axe will not do anything with. 
So on your first playthrough, you have to bare hand them to beat them. And then, of course, then you get the Blades of Chaos that absolutely wreck these guys. Yeah. So to give you one last little bit of what it feels like without them. Oh, yes. So I do appreciate that. That was some good planning on their part. That's it, it, It's an example of, like, how well they avoided the thing that I was kind of afraid that they would do when they were talking about the game pre-release. Like, the gameplay and the story work well together in this one. They don't contradict each other or clash with each other. They work well together. And that's not something that I can say about many um, modern over-the-shoulder action-adventure type games. A lot of the time, they tend to have the story and the gameplay between the story sort of exist in their own little bubbles. Oh, you mean how Laura Croft gets so upset about killing one person in the reboot game and then she spends the rest of the game just killing people no problem? Yeah, yeah. And then in between games, she's, like, going to therapy or whatever, and she's clearly, like, on the edge of going around the twist investigating this conspiracy bullshit with the new antagonists. And you go through a protracted introduction sequence where she's panicking because all this shit is happening to her again. And then the moment the gameplay starts, is like, you're, you're back. You're back in the flow. You're in the zone. But she's not allowed to be in the zone because the writers decided her being afraid was relatable and popular. <laughs> okay. But here we go. It's time to bust out the Blades of Chaos. It's one of those weird things. What was it? What if it was like a bottle of scotch? <laughs> That's actually a pretty cool detail <laughs> where there was a there's a like a room under the floor that you can hide in. But he actually put the Blades of Chaos in a nook at the top of the compartment between the floorboards and the rest of the floor. <laughs> the Blades! They're here! Under the floorboards. <laughs> it's one of those things where you're so used to the camera being pulled further back in the old games, you don't really realize how big the blades actually are. Oh, yes. Because they're still swords, you know. Yeah. Yeah, short yeah. swords. They're... I think it also helps that Kratos is himself as a large man. Yeah. So where are the chains? <laughs> There's nowhere you can hide, Spartan. Put as much distance between you and yeah, Like, where were the chains, though? <laughs> I didn't mm. see the chains in the, in, in the shot showing the sword. They are probably just under the blades, but... Uh, well, you also remember the cut... The, the cutscene is not reflective of the, the original one, because Brian's playing well, the yeah, but plus I, plus I also didn't see the chains attached to the but swords in any way. So, I think the chains are there in like an original, a fresh yeah, file. Possibly. Hmm. You will always be a monster. Love this bit here. <laughs> I know, but I am your monster no longer. Yeah, fuck you, Athena. <laughs> this shot is so good. <laughs> Just walks right through her. <laughs> And here we go. I would be really surprised they made the blades work as well as they did in this kind of gameplay and camera style. Because in the old games, the blades were very flippy and twirly and very extravagant. You know, feeling. Every attack was a sweeping attack of some kind. And... Yeah, so it was yeah. like, how do you translate that into a much more grounded and... I don't want to say subdued gameplay style, but... Well, not <laughs> they're obviously not leaning into it directly, but the thing is, stuff like chain whips, they do exist as martial arts weapons in the real world, and there are techniques that you can draw on for the choreography for a weapon like the Blades of Chaos. And they do explode on contact. <laughs> no? no? Oh, okay. So. <laughs> but, like... A chain whip is functionally a lot different than a leather whip in the in the sense that there's usually a weighted something at the end of the chain. And that's the thing you're swinging. A lot of these moves that Kratos is doing right now are straight up chain whip attacks. Just 
made wilder, you know? Like, that's... And faster, given, like, his godly Like, strength. the spinning the blades of chaos vertically thing. That's, um... I've seen... Um... I've seen practice videos of chain whip techniques that perform moves very much like that. Not quite as fast or crazy, but... It's 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 not like just a random move set that they pulled out of their asses. There are real life weapons. Yeah, and, like uh, these are these always had a basis yeah. in reality. Uh, <laughs> as wild and crazy as as it is to think that. Yeah. Um, but the mythical setting allows you to you know bend the rules about yeah. that and be extravagant with it. Anything you'd like to get off your chest, brother? And like it, that extends it, that extends also to similar weapons like. The Castlevania anime and the way Trevor Belmont uses the Morning Star Whip. He pulls off just crazier versions of a lot of uh, real life techniques there. Obviously, you wouldn't want to use a chain whip that's quite so long as Trevor Belmont's because that would be impossible to actually control. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually surprised Trevor didn't, like, knock himself out eight times. Or, you know, act. Over the course, or of accidentally series. brain see fit in the, <laughs> with the with the morning star. Yeah, or just kill <laughs> just everybody. Just kill all of his allies by mistake. Like that series ends with everybody on the floor except him. And but Dracula. like, but like uh, stuff he does with the whip, like kicking the chain to shoot the uh, to shoot the ball out at an enemy is that's that's actually that's actually a real technique a, cha a chain whip shoot. So. I've never seen the light. That's gotta be a family heirloom. No. <laughs> Nor will it ever be. <laughs> I like that line. I, I do. Like he he would never curse his son hands. with this weapon. I know from quality. And them them special. Everyone loves the blade is okay, chaos, <laughs> except Kratos. <laughs> no. What I like the way Kratos like here? deliberately doesn't look toward the dwarf while talking to him. Like, he keeps turning his face, like, away. I don't like want to talk to you. He's, he's physically trying to create distance between himself and other people. Well, I am down one short person for my journey, so... <laughs> How good you are. <laughs> But he turns back to face the dwarf after he offers help, and he wants to tell the dwarf that just working on his weapons is enough. So he sort of opens up at the end there. That's a nice, that is a nice bit of characterization. I enjoy that. <laughs> 